Well, good morning. Um, thanks so much for joining us um, and making the time this morning as part of the um, Explorers of Church Buildings um, projects. Um, this series um, will be beginning uh, this morning by looking at green spaces and going outside to look at what churches are doing to enhance mission and ministry in the places and spaces that they have. If um, there's any um, questions that you have as you go through this morning, or maybe comments, or perhaps you'd like to share your experiences too, please do make the most of the chat facility. You'll find this if you hover your cursor at the bottom of the screen, and there should be a speech bubble called chat. So do post questions, um, and we'll take the questions at um, two spots um, in, in this morning. Um, but also it's a chance for you to share your own experiences or um, your own um, things that you're wrestling with and would like some advice on. So it's very much about listening today, um, but also sharing as well. So to introduce myself, uh, my name's Emily Allen. I'm the Church Buildings Missioner for the Diocese of Chester. And I've created that this morning um, as part of a series called Explorers, um, Church Buildings Projects where in ordinary times we would visit um, a, um, a parish in person and have a look around a recent building project um, or um, looking at outside space to hear from first-hand experiences of what they've done, why they've done it, and the difference it's made to enhancing mission and ministry. Um, today, of course, we are online. Um, there will be more in the series coming later on this autumn. So do keep an eye out on the e-bulletin for some further um, explorers events. This morning, um, looking at um, St. Mary's Partington and how they've created a spiritual garden using their green space. And it's very timely for us to look at this topic now. For only last month, um, the diocese um, confirmed um, that it is aiming to become an eco-diocese which was unanimously agreed at Bishop's Council in February. And also during this season of Lent, the diocese has chosen to focus on God's creation. So if you haven't seen uh, the Lent resources on the website, um, do take a look at them. We'll post the, uh, the website address in the chat box. And this morning particularly relates to um, the seventh mini challenge which is about encouraging biodiversity. You'll hear other, other aims and other um, parts of the project, but there's one link there um, certainly to encouraging biodiversity. So after we've heard from Reverend Andrew um, from St. Mary's, um, there'll also be a chance to hear from Andrew Gilpin, who today joins us from Caring for God's Acre which is a charity and you'll be able to hear how they can support you as a parish with thinking about churchyard spaces. Um, so we'll hear presentations and after each have a time for Q&A. So Becky will be keeping an eye on the chat box and grouping together some questions. So do keep them coming as well as sharing your own experiences. So now I'd like to hand over to Reverend Andrew, who's going to open this morning in prayer. Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome. Lovely to see so many online, probably more than we've been able to fit in our garden. But so that's great that you could all be here today. I'm going to read a prayer as we start, uh, which is on the Church of England website um, under the environmental um, section. There's a whole series of prayers there from different contributors. And this is from our very own Reverend Lib Libby Lane. So let's pray. Eternal God, whose spirit moved over the face of the deep, bringing forth light and life. By that same spirit, renew your creation and restore your image in our people. Turn us from careless tenants to faithful stewards, that your threefold blessing of clean air, pure water and rich earth may be the inheritance of everything that has the breath of life. And one generation may proclaim to another the wonder of your works. Through Jesus Christ, your living word, in whom the fullness of your glory is revealed. Amen. 
Okay, I think I can make a start. So I'm going to uh, share my screen. Hopefully everybody will be able to see that shortly. There we go. Okay. So let me welcome you all uh, virtually um, to St. Mary's in Partington. Um, if you've not heard of Partington, um, it, was, well, it was first recorded back in about 1260. It's uh, one of a medieval parish in, of Bowdoin about 11 miles southwest of Manchester on the outskirts of Manchester near Warburton and Carrington. It was originally part of the ancient fee, the ancient lands of Dun and Massey. Many of you will know Dun and Massey if you come across to the National Trust place here. And it grew up around a paper mill built in 1732 on the banks of the River Mersey. In fact, the paper mill was uh, about the first big industry that came to Trafford um, and it grew of course after that. The railway came here in 1873 and slowly Partington became more industrialized around, although it did maintain its sort of country feel and its uh, farmland around. So Mary's Church, as you see here, was built in 1884. Um, and at the time, Partington was a little Cheshire country village of about 600 people in a few streets couple of public houses and grocers, farms and cottages in the countryside. And they opened a coal gas works here uh, in the 1950s and that then, sorry, 1930s, and then that began to grow the village out from here. And as they demolished some of the uh, sort of more slum dwellings, I suppose, of Manchester and Salford and Stratford and clear those for new houses. So we became an overspill town on the outskirts of Manchester. Now we're about eight and a half thousand people in the parish of Partington and Carrington, which surrounds this uh, beautiful and very distinctive looking church. The church itself was uh, built by uh, the Scottish architect George Truffitt, uh, one of the lesser known founding fathers of the School of Architecture in London. He was a distinctly eccentric and non-conformist designer and uh, express some of his more interesting designs through his uh, churches uh, with his most innovative, innovative designs. They're actually quite controversial and were recognized as works of art. Uh, none of his buildings were deemed to be academically correct. They all had interesting features both inside and out, but that didn't bother him at all. And I've got a quote here from a couple of years ago uh, from an architectural journal that said, true fits buildings and approaches are perhaps even more pertinent today and have a lasting resonance for which he should be so much better remembered. And um, this actually is a photograph that we discovered in a house in Partington. Uh, the date on the back dates it to about 1906. Uh, and you can see the, the, the features of the building there. And he was keen to involve contextualized approach to architecture using local materials. So. The church itself, as you see here, is faced in limestone that comes from a quarry in Runcorn, about 15 miles from the church. So the local materials came in to build it. It was grade two listed uh, in January 2001. So that's a look at the front of the church with some of the oldest gravestones from the, the 1800s in the summertime with the beech tree. And if I take you round the corner, and you can see the church from the back. Here, you can see the extent of the graveyard. It's a closed churchyard, um, except for burials in family graves, but we do do a lot of burials of ashes here. And the extension there was built on the back. This is in the 1990s and serves as a parish room, but doesn't really distract from the, the shape of the building. That's a view now, but if we go back 20, 30 years, it was in quite a sorry state. The grounds itself, where you see the lawns now, were overgrown with brambles and weeds, and that takes quite a lot of clearing with scythes every so often. As for the rest of the grounds, at times, especially on this estate, um, we found there was quite a bit of vandalism. Uh, people who would volunteer would come and find that stones had been pushed over, walls had been graffitied, and it was a bit of a constant battle um, in this local community. 
the members of the church at that time, a group of guys decided that this couldn't stay and we really needed to do something about this problem. They tackled it, of course, by repairing, but mostly by meeting with the youngsters who were playing and vandalizing the grounds. They got to know them. They had some quite sensible conversations with them and steered some of the younger lads on a good path. And still today, uh, some of the families that we meet at church, some of the guys were the kids who were here at the time, and they still know the gardening guys and the lessons that they gave them um, and putting them on a good path um, and not to do this sort of damage. So with engagement with those who were here, we were able to uh, turn that around and begin to restore the grounds themselves. This picture shows something about local engagement. All the paths at that time were muddy, sandy paths um, with no stones down, no edges, um, quite hard to keep track of in terms of weeds, etc., and got quite muddy in the winter. But we're in a large kind of social housing council estate. So the idea was launched that many people, of course, have council slabs um, in their back gardens or patios, and as houses were being developed, they didn't need them. So they put out an appeal uh, for local people to donate some of those council flags and over 700 were donated and brought into the grounds. From there, we had to clean them up at the time and also lay some sand underneath. And it was estimated that this cost around a pound a flag. And so there was a, you can imagine a sponsor the flag going on. People sponsored individual flagstones and the entire graveyard uh, was laid with newish flags, none of them quite matched, they're different shades, but they form very neat paths all around the grounds. And this sets in motion really, uh, over the last 20 years, how we've used recycling and repurposing um, to enhance our graveyard here. So for example, lots of our metal gates and handrails have been salvaged from other building projects around the parish from the old shell works um, just down the road from local houses, handrail from a doctor's surgery. And uh, our, one of our congregation members, Eddie, who was a welder, managed to put together gates and restore gates. Even the posts you see here were way on the other side of the ground and uh, salvaged from under some undergrowth and repurposed and repainted. The container that you see in the back of a lorry and that contains all our tools and um, uh, stuff equipment for the gardens. The container costs 675 pounds delivered. And uh, one of our gardening team, Ron, organized uh, a yard sale at the house on the lawn. And through that raised 680 pounds, mm. five pounds to spare. And the container was installed and painted up and provides a, a safe space for us. The little concrete ramp that's there, well, there was a house building going on just across the road from us, a new estate, and just by cheekily wandering on and chatting to the guys on the estate, persuaded them to come over and build us a concrete ramp from the spare materials that we had. Be cheeky, ask anybody that's around, see what you can salvage, see what you can use. You can't see here, but there were two full-sized street lamps and uh, which look after the car park. And they were salvaged from a council yard at Trafford, spotted there by an eagle-eyed member of the congregation. 10 pounds was offered for each and two full-size street lamps on the back of a car somehow were transported up to Partington uh, and erected. A more modern recycling would be the bench. And you'll see they're made of recycled slabs and timber that weren't wanted in a garden. And even the block paving up to the church was donated by a church member. So really keep your eyes open, uh, look around, and it's amazing what can be salvaged, especially when local building works are going on or, or recycling works. The other way we've managed the garden is to engage local companies. This is Galloway, the building company who are based in Carrington, the old schoolhouse near the church in Carrington. We've done a little bit of tidying work around their car park for them, cutting back some trees that were on our graveyard down there in Carrington and so on this bit of goodwill we approached them and asked if they would help us by rebuilding the gates posts that enter 
into the land. And you'll see these here were crumbling away. And these two guys came and did a fantastic job over two days and completely rebuilt the gateway into the church garden. Uh, this one shows, without a word of a lie, the bill that was for the works that they did. And I hope you can see there, uh, they, managed, they did everything for us from the, um, from the gate posts to the, uh, the brickwork, all the materials, everything was provided for free. And uh, our only obligation as a church was to supply the tea and coffee and the prayers for good weather. Of course, we come together for our volunteers. And if we look back over the last 20 to 30 years, we've had over 50 volunteers from the church and from the local community uh, that have come together to do the grounds here. They've included those who are younger and older, some teens during the holidays, men and women together. Uh, we've had a couple of asylum seekers work with us in voluntary work, those who are retired and those who are at work. It's also been a little group of seven ladies who have helped us with the teas and coffees and come in during the course of the gardening um, and set up in our St George's room, that extension room, and shared tea and coffee and toast um, at half time for all the gardeners. Um, that's been their way of adding to and serving our garden at the time. And really the whole project is so much more about companionship, fellowship and belonging to a community essentially social prescribing in a sense, tackling isolation. It's super good for mental and physical and even spiritual help. Um, recently getting people on their first steps of faith. So some of the guys who have come to church recently um, through this project, and in fact, one of them in the last couple of years was recently baptized in his seventies and is now a, a full member of our church. Also others have come at times of bereavement to find a community that's just caught them up and given them a great sense of purpose. I've just got a couple of quotes here from some of the gardening team um, who have shared with me. Uh, one of them says, for me being a part of the gardening team is amazing. I joined during a difficult time of my life and have been really fortunate to have got to know a great group of people. Sometimes just being able to offload really helps and we've worked really well together regardless of age and with lots of banter. Another said, being a member of the gardening team helps me cope better with my physical disabilities and my mental health. I feel that while voluntary work is done at the churchyard, it's of benefit to the whole community. Another said, I love to work in the gardening team, making it look beautiful for our community. Meeting not only helps with our mental well-being, but helps us feel proud when people thank us for looking after their relatives' graves and the church grounds. So this is all res restoration of the grounds uh, themselves and how we've got in other people to come and help. But one particular part of the garden has drawn quite a bit of attention over the last two years. You'll remember this photo, hopefully, and you'll see on the right-hand side was an area of unused ground, roughly planted with some bulbs and things, but generally overgrown and not really used. And so our plan was hatched to dig out from that uh, an area to make a path that ran up and through behind the trees and back down the other side. And once the path was made, the beds were began to be dug and trees were planted as a form of remembrance. This became our spiritual garden. And here a couple of years later, it's just looking at that garden. So some more flags laid through and some edging strips put in and the beds laid on either side. What was a neglected area, especially with our recycled bench there, is now an area of recreation, reflectance, and remembrance. And of course, through all this work, it's really given the impression that the church grounds are alive and well, that Jesus is alive and well in our community, that the church is flourishing, and you can see the volunteers working out there. I should have said they do. Tuesday mornings and Thursday mornings, um, weather permitting, and volunteer in those times. As you can agree, I hope it's a, it's a wonderful space. It's a nice open space and looks out upon the church 
and across Partington itself and into the community. A got a chap called Eddie from our church then had the clever idea of not just letting the garden tell the story of the life of the church, but letting the garden tell the story of creation, of Jesus and the gospel itself. And so in the planting and in the features to begin to tell the gospel story. And this for us was quite a novel way of gardening. So I'll show you another picture there. Uh, this is in the, the springtime with the blossom on the trees. A different sort of look with the uh, um, tulips and bulbs there. And on the right hand side, some of the planting, even on a wet, uh, wet early summer day. It's taken by one of our church members. So let's have a look at the spiritual planting here. The most obvious feature uh, with a little sign there that says God's promise, a rainbow of spring bulbs. And there's even more colours now that come up um, in the spring. And then another um, bedding plants that are replanted in the summer. To accompany you through the garden, we created a, a prayer leaflet, like a reflection leaflet that includes photographs of the different installations. And amongst those, I will read you a little bit uh, that regards the rainbow. It says this. Our garden has a rainbow of colour picked out in bulbs in the spring and replanted in flowers in the summer. Have you stopped to think how creation itself appears to proclaim the glory of God all around us and teaches us the nature of God? Take the rainbow. It's bright, colourful, awe-inspiring. It's a gift that brings a smile to your face. Yet there will be no rainbow without rain or storms. In the stormy times of life, when worry or sadness surround us, remember that after the storm comes a rainbow of radiant colour that stretches end to end across the sky. Life is full of ups and downs, but the mercy of God is eternal and will bring us through all things, enabling us to rejoice again after the storm has passed. The rainbow is the sign of God's steadfast protection and promise to be with us. And then there's a, a prayer for hope and joy in the midst of every storm of life. And that's just one part of our prayer leaflet that you can pick up and takes you on a journey through the grounds. Here's some other features a bit further on in the spiritual garden, a wooden installation, just being refurbed at the moment uh, of the Last Supper. And around that is 12 little fuchsia plants for the disciples and a white rose for Jesus in the center. At the bottom in the left-hand corner is an area of the burning bush. Um, so back into the Old Testament, how Moses stepped aside to investigate the bush that was burning, yet not burned up. And there's a little tray in front of that in the ground of sand to represent the banks of the River Jordan and actually some shells that were brought back from the Holy Land. Further on in stones picked out uh, from recycled cobbles from another area of the churchyard, the words, God so loved the world. And above that, a cross. And lest we not forget, you may identify the plant that surrounds it, which of course is forget-me-nots, which I think was a lovely idea except that I think they grow really vigorously and we have to keep them in check. But it's a good witness to, uh, to the cross in that part of the garden. Uh, the others are part of an art project that was done, and I'll show you a picture of that later at Easter. So some of the fruits of the Spirit spelt out there in stones. This whole area has allowed us to engage the local primary and secondary schools who come and visit the grounds and have a tour around. And of course, it's really easy then to talk into and open up some of these familiar gospel stories just by the pictures that they see, the planting that we see, and it just engages the youngsters in conversation. And of course, when they've come to visit later, perhaps even at a time of bereavement, and they've known something of the grounds, they can explain that and share that with family, and they feel that they belong. For many years, we were part of Partington's 
entry to the Northwest Britain in Blue competition. And that was able to gain Partington as a whole um, a silver award for many years for the great work that the parish council does um, in planting around our community. But we were asked at the time when the judges saw our garden as part of that to perhaps think about entering it independently as a ground. And we did that in 2019. The fabulous news was in our very first time of entering, the Royal Horticultural Society in the Northwest Britain in Bloom competition was able to award us uh, an outstanding award. That's level five, the highest award for the neighborhood um, garden. And we've entered again this year, hoping to reach the, the same standard. This was a huge endorsement for everybody um, who'd been involved in the gardening project, everybody who volunteered over the years. It was a great story to tell our local community and something to tell people we applied for funds for too. Uh, they were mostly really impressed with the sustainability of the garden, its easy access, the fact that it was a graveyard yet was full of life and was a place not just for remembrance but also for rest and recreation too. And so we've opened up the garden for all manner of uh, community engagement projects to help us in our mission and evangelism across our parish. I'll give you some examples. This was Christmas Eve in the grounds of the church. Uh, Partington, uh, through a group called Love Partington, had organised a tour looking for Clive the Elf, who you see here. And Clive the Elf was visiting various places around the parish through Advent and ended up with us on Christmas Eve. So lots of photographs of the kids, lots of selfies, or I suppose they should be uh, elfies. Um, <laughs> with our elf in the garden grounds uh, and of course whilst they were with us we were able to engage them with the elf and with cutouts of Mary, Joseph and the three kings and again get them familiar with the grounds here. Something we could safely do in Covid of course as well. This was a remembrance across the graveyard again something that we could do outside uh, engaging the local primary schools, two local primary schools and members of the congregation uh, on the 75th anniversary, we erected 75 crosses uh, through our grounds, all made by children in classes or by individuals in the church. And this was up for a month, again, encouraging many people to come and walk around the graveyard, engage with the space, um, and it was really quite a stunning um, display. And at Easter, a couple of years ago, we were again able to encourage the spiritual garden to be a place for an Easter trail. And this again was around our local community, but everybody came here um, as part of the Palm Sunday aspect of that. We were able to share stories, uh, engage members of our congregation to meet with the youngsters. We'd recycled a whole cobbled area of our graveyard into flags because it was becoming difficult to manage and was a bit slippery and so using those cobbles co cobbles cleaned up uh, we were able to do an art painting project uh, the kids here painting up par palm leaves and a word of praise a word of praise to God on each of the stones which lined our garden throughout and remained actually in the garden for a couple of years um, all done have recently been moved so we can refurbish that part it was a wonderful way of getting um, lots of local children to explore the garden. And as part of that, you'll see the question mark here as we were engaging them with some materials um, about asking who is Jesus and why should we follow him? And apart from schools and local community and local children, another group of the Salford Foundation um, that's the charity uh, organising the National Citizen Service teenagers who've come and based themselves in the church and the church grounds for three years running now. They've helped out with the church grounds, done some painting and gardening for us here, but also from here and using us as a base, have been able to get out into other local gardens. And this is an Eam House uh, for profoundly disabled young people, a wonderful place and facility just across the road from us here in Partington and that's the gang visiting them and restoring their garden um, based on ideas that they had between them, doing a bit of painting of a face, 
a fence panel there. So it becomes a wonderful place of life, not just for the gardening team and the church, but for the whole community, for visitors, for schools. And all of these become wonderful stories for social media. Anything I share on our Facebook page, which is then shared on to a community page of over three and a half, four thousand people, um, then gets shared enormously. And uh, we can really get the word out quickly about what we're doing. And people that tap into that then will tap into other things that we do. Well, in this period of Lent, uh, where as a diocese we're thinking about um, care of public spaces. So I should say something about some of the issues of public spaces too, and practicalities. It is a public space, of course. So yes, we do get the occasional bit of vandalism, although that's now really very rare. And I put that partly down to the fact that we're having school children in, um, in their classes coming to explore and to look around and to learn about what we do as a church for our community. If they know the place, they feel they own something of the place, they're less likely to abuse it. We also try to avoid enclosed spaces. So the bench, for example, is in a really bright public space. You can look right out across the ground. It's not secluded in any way. We've got good lighting overnight. Uh, we keep the gates open through the day, but then close them up by night. I've got some evidence there of drug use. You do see bits around the place. Um, we've also had, I did wake up one morning to find the police searching the grounds for a firearm at one point. So do things do come through at times. But what we found is that if we engage people, then um, you can solve a lot of these issues. So when we've had teenagers, for example, drinking in the grounds, I've gone and joined them and uh, had a good conversation. And it doesn't take long till it's not cool to be out drinking with the vicar and they tend to move on and find another space. So keeping good open space, keeping a good eye on things, having the gardeners in a couple of times a week, and I take a wander around as well. And some of our local community do their walk through the grounds and again, clear things as they go. And with a couple of large litter bins as well, means that we keep on top of the grounds. In this week of Lent, we're thinking about uh, environmental sustainability and encouraging diversity. And that was something that the, the RHS were really pleased to see in our grounds. So here are some examples with some bird boxes in the trees, with the fat balls and feeding for the birds. Um, that's a challenge. You do definitely have to try and encourage donations of those because the birds get through an awful lot of those very quickly. Um, of recycling water. And we've got one at the moment, which soon to install a second water butt, so we're not using our mains water as much as we can. Of sustainable planting, rather than planting lots of bedding plants every year, finding plants that will come back year after year. And then composting and recycling. Um, this is the rather discouraging sign, I think, on our uh, compost bin area at the back of the church. Um, but we keep uh, a proportion of our leaves and grass cuttings and turn them into uh, compost for the coming year. We try and use natural materials where we can. We try and limit the use of chemicals where we can and recycle as much as we can. And with all of that in mind, we're going to look um, as a church to get an eco church award, um, just as the diocese is in this coming year of which the garden will be a very central feature. If you're looking at this and thinking um, they've got a lot of voluntary help and uh, we've got a lot of donations over the years, how do we fund ourselves? There are equipment to service and service well and regularly so everything is safe to use. There are new bits of wood and paint and, uh, to uh, restore things, uh, maybe other things to buy in. So there are expenses um, to have. So some of the places you can get funding um, don't underestimate grants. Uh, we recently got an inclusive neighbourhood grant from Trafford Council for about £1,500. It's an award for projects where residents show pride in where they live, be active in the community, build lasting relationships and have fun. And you realise that a gardening project such as this 
has a wonderful story to tell of all of those things. And when it comes to writing those sorts of grants, it's very easy to talk about the benefits that it will bring to your community, especially in terms of social prescribing, which is kind of in vogue at the moment. Of course, getting an award has helped and being able to demonstrate the engagement with the community and social media too. You have a really good story to tell. Other things to look out for are green initiatives. Um, a whole area of the graveyard from the gate as you came in to the container on the right hand side was funded as part of the Red Rose Forest in Greater Manchester in 1994. It was a mechanism for the economic, social and environmental regeneration of the countryside, but within our towns and cities. So to create little woodland areas within urban areas. And through that funding, um, that ground was cleared by uh, people that came in to do that for us and then planted with sustainable tree species. Fundraising, of course, uh, more traditional fundraising, uh, especially if you're fundraising for a particular thing, a particular installation or a particular bit of equipment, you can really see the benefit that that makes. Community donations. Um, once people see us and they know what we're up to, it's surprising how many little checks and donations come through the door uh, on behalf of families who just really appreciate having had the ground and the fact that their relative's grave is so well looked after. Um, also donations, I'm told, of uh, biscuits and bottles of wine, but they don't generally make it back to the vicarage. They disappear somewhere on route, I think. Um, I was recently given £100 just to refer the litter bins so they look better in church, again by a, a member of our community. It's that witness out that really just brings back those sorts of benefits as well. Local nurseries, of course, always worth any time you buy anything from a local nursery to say what it's for in terms of the local project. There's usually somebody who'll give you a bit of a discount or throw in an extra tray of flowers, something like that. And of course, don't underestimate the time and skills and materials from members of your congregation, but also members of the local community. There will be builders, welders, gardeners, builders, um, electricians, carpenters, all sorts of people out there who will be willing at least to give advice and if not just help you with the job and be proud to do so um, and get you out in the ground. So I'm going to finish with this last slide. I was chatting to one of our gardening team, Ron, in the week and asked about why and how he did what he did and um, this is the verse that he came back to, James 2.18 and, and something of this was picked up in that prayer from Bishop Libby at the beginning says this, now someone may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. For many, they are being their witness to Jesus in our community in a very practical, very open way. It sparked all sorts of conversations. It's drawn people to our church. It's kept people alongside. It's given inspiration. It's given energy. And it's just given that companionship and, and consolation when it's needed to. Um, so it's been wonderful to invite people and join us from our community that's been part, or they really feel part, of the church community, whether they come on a Sunday or not. Let's show our deeds in this way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, the, uh, the comments already coming in the, the chat. Um, I've shown uh, there's so much in there about the, uh, the richness of mission within this project. And um, it really struck me around um, encouraging biodiversity it actually takes on a whole nother meaning when we're looking at the life of the church and actually that diversity of connections of drawing people together it speaks more, more, not only of nature itself, but actually of, of um, a witness to Christ's love and the, the number of contacts that came through there. Um, that there's so many uh, different aspects to, to draw out there from um, upcycling and, and salvaging materials um, to thinking about that, how that actually connects with communities as well as being um, more sustainable, uh, working with local communities, 
um, and fostering that goodwill together of working together with, with communities. Um, the role of volunteers and the, um, how much coming alongside people and giving an opportunity to make connections and actually build those relationships as, as the founding of, of, of mission, as well as the, um, the looking at telling the gospel story through nature um, and the events that are held there, as well as the, the work with young people and the citizen service. Um, so thank you for so much for sharing with us that this morning. Um, we'll now uh, stop the recording to take um, some questions and answers um, and the, the work of caring for God's Acre and how that may be able to support you. And then we'll have a time for um, Q&A afterwards. Um, so if we could um, press the record uh, now. Lovely, I'd like to, uh, to welcome um, Andrea's presentation on uh, caring for God's Acre and then we'll have a time of discussion afterwards. Thank you. Speaker on mute. Yeah, there's no sound there. Sorry about that, everyone. I'll start again. I do apologise. Site ranges from under a quarter of an acre for a small. Sorry, I do apologise. parish church or chapel to over 200 acres. Sorry, I am having technical difficulties. I do apologise. I'm just going to go out and come back in. Hello and welcome. God's Acre is a charity dedicated to the conservation of all burial grounds. We work towards these sites being beautiful, welcoming and connected to their communities. We're a national charity covering England and Wales and 2020 was our 20th anniversary. We focus on the conservation of the natural, built and social heritage and support burial grounds of all types and sizes, ranging from rural church or chapel yards to green burial sites and urban cemeteries. There are over 20,000 burial grounds in England and Wales, spanning different cultures, religions and centuries. The size of each site ranges from under a quarter of an acre for a small parish church or chapel to over 200 acres for a large cemetery. Added together, the area is similar to that of Exmoor National Park or the Isle of Wight. The key point is that these sites are distributed in a way that means that they are accessible to a significant number of the population and they are perfect to become biodiversity hotspots right on people's doorsteps. There are several reasons why churchyards are fabulous places for nature. First, your churchyard in the Diocese of Chester is probably the most ancient enclosed piece of land in a parish, town or city. The grassland would have been relatively undisturbed, reseeding naturally for hundreds if not thousands of years. 
It would also have been both scythed for hay and grazed by animals during its time as a burial ground. A benefit of this management over a very long time is a rich diversity of grasses, flowers and animals. This old unimproved grassland was once widespread in the UK but is now rare. Since the 1940s over 97% has vanished mainly due to agricultural practices such as adding fertilisers, herbicides or ploughing. Your churchyard is likely to predate the 1940s so it will be one of the few havens in the whole of the UK where this ancient habitat remains. Providing the site hasn't been neglected and the grass cuttings are raked up and removed regularly, this important flower-rich grassland persists regardless of whether the grass is kept short mown or long like a meadow. For example, the photo here is of St Lawrence's, situated right in the middle of the town of Church Stretton in Shropshire. All they did to have this show of wild flowers that we can see to the right is simply let it grow. All the species were here just waiting to flower. We will be running a webinar in a few weeks talking about the ins and outs of managing areas in a way that encourages wildflowers while still being sensitive to visitors' needs. The community of plants, fungi and animals, particularly insects, that we find in churchyards have taken many years to establish. Country churchyards and urban cemeteries are among the best places to find a variety of fungi, particularly grassland ones. This is because these fungi thrive in old undisturbed grassland which has not been ploughed, reseeded or treated with chemicals. Wax caps, fairy clubs, coral fungi are amongst the colourful and interesting ones that can flourish. Before the development of the microscope in the 18th century, fungi were a puzzle appearing overnight and sometimes taken to be the work of dark powers. The visible part is now known to be the fruit filled with tiny spores with the rest of the fungi below ground. Churchyards often have a mixture of tree types which is really valuable to birds that raise several broods in the breeding season. These species have to start early so may use a conifer as a nesting site for the first nest when deciduous trees are leafless and then may switch to the deciduous trees later in the season. Many sites offer a wealth of nesting, feeding and roosting opportunities. Think of the external building walls with buttresses, gargoyles, ledges, porches, towers, spires, along with moss and ivy covered memorials. The list goes on. Birds such as blackbirds, song thrushes and wrens use a burial site all year round, nesting in trees and hedges. As natural outcrops of rock and stone have decreased over the years, churchyards have become of supreme importance for lichen conservation. Of the 1,700 British species, over a third have been found in burial grounds and many sites have well over 100 species on the stonework, on trees and in the grassland. Burial grounds support many species of lichen for a variety of reasons. The different rocks and building materials have distinctive lichen communities, limestone, sandstone, marble and mortar etc. Also the stonework varies from rough to smooth, shaded to exposed, damp to dry, horizontal to vertical, and all of these provide different niches for lichens. The lichens on the shaded north side of a wall are different from those on the sunny south side. Almost half of these are rare and seldom if ever occur in other places, so it's really important to look after them by leaving them on the stone and not rubbing them off. Another way to inspire others is to invite your local school or your local cub or brownie group. We have an education pack aimed at primary age children and covers many topics with activities and templates and can be used by those running messy church, teachers at primary schools or used at fates and open days. It covers five topics ranging from marvellous monuments to art and architecture. 
each containing several activities and ideas, including photographs, worksheets and templates. In order to highlight the specialness of burial grounds, we have our own Love Your Burial Ground Week. It used to be called Cherishing Churchyards Week, but as so many groups managing varying types of burial grounds wanted to register their events, we changed the name to reflect this. It takes place in the second week of June every year, taking in two weekends. This year, we have partnered with the Church of England, Church in Wales and Arosha to ask churches to use the week as a springboard to start recording the wildlife within their churchyards. So if you fancy running a wildlife spotting event in Love Your Burial Ground Week, then please pop to our website and fill out the registration form and we'll send you more information nearer the time, including our Church's Count on La Nature logo for you to use. We have some resources that will help you encourage others to spot wildlife during this week. We have a starter guide and botanical companion that are really useful publications to help identify wildlife and can also be used to engage others to record what they see in your churchyard. We can post you some starter guides for free and the botanical companion is free to download from our website or we can send you a copy for a small fee. Many people feel that they can't identify wildlife, but with a bit of guidance, they soon realise they can, and writing them out on a list is really satisfying. The challenge can be to find as many species as possible, and if you think about it, most people can identify yew, oak, holly buttercup, snowdrop, dandelion, daisy and ivy, and that's eight species straight away. In the Botanical Companion, we have a list of the most commonly found plant species in burial grounds, so that would be a really good starting place. This could be done as part of a socially distanced event or you could encourage people to record on their own. Once people have started looking at what wildlife there is, you can be sure that they'll be looking at your churchyard in a different way and feel much more connected to it. It is likely that at one time or another, someone has undertaken a survey of the plants in your burial ground and if you ask around, you may be able to locate a historical list. We're working with the National Biodiversity Network and other organisations to collate records, both past and present, onto one system which is here. I'll pop the address in the comments. So, if you search for your burial ground on this database, you'll find a list of species that have been recorded and the dates they were seen. So, for example, yesterday, I popped St John the Baptist in Chester in the search bar of this database and came up with five squirrel records and the date they were recorded. If you submit your wildlife records to our system, they will go onto this database, which is publicly accessible and a fun way of logging and viewing the records found within your burial ground. You can watch the tally go up as new records come in. And so, as we amble to the end of this talk, for one of the final slides, here is an aerial view of St George's Churchyard in Leicester. This helps put into context the importance of where many sites are, nestled right in the hearts of communities, accessible for those without transport, those with mobility difficulties, and perfect for many who would like to find a peaceful space in their busy day. If managed properly, these churchyards can be hotspots for biodiversity and form an essential part of the Green Corridor Network for Wildlife. We can help in many ways. We have free resources on our website. We have an action pack free to download, along with mini films that go over topics such as how to create a management brief, how to manage your grass and how to engage the wider community in events. We have an education pack aimed at primary age children and covers many topics with activities and templates so they can be used by those running a messy church, a Sunday school, teachers at primary schools or at fates and open days. We have telephone and email so do contact us at any time if you have a question. If you want to find a flower rich site near you then pop to our burial grounds to inspire webpage where we are mapping sites that we would recommend visiting in the summer months. Also, if you have a well-managed site that you feel could be on this map, then do let us know. 
sign up to our e-newsletter for a bi-monthly roundup of initiatives and help. And let us know what wildlife you've seen in your burial ground. We look forward to finding out what you discover. Thanks so much, uh, Andrea, for um, sharing your presentation. Um, just before we go to um, questions, um, I'd like to invite uh, Peter Froggart, um, the Director of Outreach for the Diocese of Chester, to say um, some, um, some interesting news, hopefully, um, about the Diocese and Caring for God's Acre. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, thank you, Andrew, very much. That was uh, brilliant. Um, uh, it's uh, very exciting possible news. <laughs> Um, we're waiting to hear uh, if uh, funding has been confirmed for um, a series of webinars that Caring for God's Acre would be putting on um, in the spring of this year, from the end of April and onwards, really designed exactly at this, at helping churches make the best use of their churchyards, both for ecological reasons, uh, but also for social and missional reasons. Um, we've seen brilliant opportunities there are from Andrew, just in building relationships between church members and with members of communities locally. And it does seem to me that this time, as we slowly emerge from COVID, this sort of activity is going to be really helpful. It's a safe, socially distant environment. It's flexible. I think there are people cautious about coming back to church who would be really glad of an invitation to come to be part of a, a church out of working party or to come and visit some sort of activity that you might do in the churchyard. Uh, people in local communities may be nervous about going into the church building, but they'd love to come into the churchyard and see what's happening. So it seems a very timely opportunity and we're very much hoping, and I'm pretty confident uh, that we will be able to let you know about a series of webinars that Andrea will be running, uh, six or eight of them over the late spring and early summer. Um, it, there's no expectation you'll come to all of them. We'll publicize what they are and pick out the ones that are most appropriate for you, whether it's to do with plants or animals and biodiversity, whether it's to do with managing teams of volunteers or connecting with the community. And there are lots of different aspects of the work that Andrew has experience of and will tell us about. So I guess my, my exciting news is watch this space. Um, I'm inspired by what we've seen today and I hope that many other churches across the diocese will make the most of it. It does seem uh, a very timely idea just at the moment um, uh, and could be a great uh, benefit to churches and communities over the summer. Advert over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Okay, if we uh, stop the recording, I suppose that the, the uh, one aspect of it, uh, but hopefully, um, as we've heard from Peter, that the conversation can continue in, in various ways. So I'd like to, um, to thank uh, um, Andrew and for Andrea for giving such inspiring presentations this morning. Um, I hope you have uh, gained from it uh, inspiration and uh, information to take back to your own parishes and um, picked up some, um, some links as well from us sharing uh, what other people um, are connected with or, or doing. And we'll, um, we'll copy and paste the chat and the Q&A so you have those links after today. Um, so thank you so much for giving your, all your time uh, this morning. Um, we'll just uh, close in prayer. Creator God, thank you that you are the one who sustains um, your creation and cares deeply for us and for all of uh, the nature that you have given as gifts. Lord, I pray that... Um, your will be known to each parish here represented. That your heart to make yourself known through Christ will come through the ideas, the conversations, the links, the relationships that develop after today. Lord, I ask your blessing on each parish here represented as we go um, forth in making your name known. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you so much for coming and um, it's a wonderful a real encouragement to see everybody and so many turnouts uh, this morning so thank you very much for, for joining us and God bless. Thank you.